Well, thank you very much, Reverend Bryant. I'm David Taylor, Chairman of the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference. And um, you, of course, as the viewers know, uh, this event was supposed to have been held earlier this year. Uh, we're grateful to be back uh, some six months later. Uh, one of the invitations that we had extended back in the spring was to the Speaker of the House, Mike Terzai from Allegheny County. Of course, now uh, Speaker Terzai has retired and is in the private sector, but certainly he leaves a long and uh, lasting legacy in Pennsylvania. And before we go to John Gizzi for his conversation with former Speaker Terzai, we want to bring you this uh, tribute video uh, to the Speaker and his distinguished career. Fundamentally, why is the state in the business of selling wine and spirits? The vast majority of states have a private sector system. Sometimes in Pennsylvania, the incremental is actually revolutionary. And getting that um, over the goal line and boxing Wolf into signing it um, was in some ways revolutionary itself. I had a lot of young members. They began to just make it clear that this mattered to them too and that they wanted to show that they were really behind limited government and wanted to make a difference. And when we passed it, it was historic. Uh, it was historic, 105 votes, I'll never forget the day. Yes, it's convenience, but it's also showing the rest of the country and, and to a certain extent the world that Pennsylvania is moving out of an antiquated system and into the 21st century. I grew up in Allegheny County during a time when unemployment was nearly 20% with the collapse of the steel industry. And here we have all these brownfield sites, many of them on the rivers, that used to have manufacturing facilities that paid people great wages. And then you see this development in natural gas. Wolf runs and he wants to punish it or tax it. And they're the big bad enemies, the natural gas companies, not employers who actually employ people for great family sustaining wages. So we did a tax credit under Governor Corbin. I had to get the votes as majority leader. We got 144 votes. To get that vote on that tax credit, and then, and today, go down to see the Shell petrochemical facility, Shell Polymers, 6,500 skilled tradespeople building that facility, over 150 cranes. These are Western Pennsylvanians. Carpenters, electricians, laborers, operating engineers, steam fitters, iron workers. Beaver County has gone from four hotels to 31 hotels. They built an entirely new water treatment facility plant. Shell built that for the communities where they're putting that building. Cleaner water, better schools, family sustaining jobs. That can happen all over Pennsylvania. Terra 2 Hill has a bill to identify every brownfield and abandoned manufacturing site in the state so that we can start turning them into these type of facilities that have great family sustaining jobs. She says she is a brownfield site sitting in the middle of Hazleton. She uses the phrase, let's take the rust off the rust belt. Let's put people in great family sustaining jobs. We need that tax credit on Wolf's desk. It will transform the Northeast as the facility is beginning to do in the Southwest. One of the things that happened under Governor Corbett when I became majority leader, we had had this Welfare Human Services Reform Task Force. Some of them started with this thing called cash assistance. You know, it was debilitating because it was a disincentive to go work. Oftentimes seeing these EBT cards as part of these drug transactions. Folks, we provide health insurance, Medicaid. We do CHIP for children. Think of people's needs. Are we meeting their direct needs? Health insurance? We do public education. Have to make sure it's good. We're spending record amounts. We do, um, with respect to heating, there's a lie heat program, partly federal funded, but for those that are having trouble paying their heating bills, we make sure that their heating bills get paid. Food stamps, you know, TANF, partly federal, partly state, we administer it. Food stamps to make sure that you have nutrition. When I became majority leader, 
In 2011, 8% unemployment. We are at less than 4% unemployment today. Now, some of that's the president's policies and the changes that have happened on a pres uh, federal level, without a doubt. But a lot of it is because we have been steady and stable in our governance of Pennsylvania. We do not overly spend. We look at our revenues. We present and accomplish balanced budgets. We don't willy-nilly increase taxes or tax rates. We have turned the trajectory around in Pennsylvania. We're moving in a positive direction because we are steady and stable and responsible and we want to create economic opportunity. Pennsylvania has the third highest um, average starting teacher salary, the second highest average teacher salary. We contribute over $5 billion to the teachers' pensions, but in terms of performance, there are areas that are not succeeding and it is not because of money and, and parents should have choices. My dad was a public school teacher. My brother's a public school teacher. I've got one boy who's graduated from a high school, public school, and another that's going to. But I also had one in a small Catholic school and Lydia and I could afford it, but not everybody can. School choice allows parents, grandparents, guardians, and children to make the best decision for his or her child. There's gonna be more and more opportunities for charters across the state, and there should be. One size does not fit all. A baby, an unborn child has a heartbeat. You can detect a heartbeat, you know, somewhere along, along what, six to eight weeks time? By 18 weeks, I think it is. Um, they have every organ that, it, that you or I have. They have every organ, all their fingers, all their toes. They can feel pain. And then, you know, some people want to uh, eliminate a, an unborn child because there's been a diagnosis for Down syndrome. Karen Gaffney, who has an honorary degree, spoke and she said, you know, there are those that feel that we're, that Down syndrome is incompatible with life. Incompatible with life is what she said. I, I'm not incompatible with life. I don't like to castigate people. I want to find some common ground to reduce the number of abortions in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I want to have a civil and loving debate. Uh, but in the end, I do think the violence of abortion tears down the mom, tears down the family, tears down community, and we have to uh, build up. Every human being can contribute in some very positive way. And you know, our state level of funding with respect to childcare services and for services for those born with disabilities, there are record levels. It's not like we're not taking care of our responsibility to help the most vulnerable once they're born, because we do. Both matter. The 28th district, which has elected me since 2001, I love, I love uh, the families and the folks that I represent. And uh, that includes the citizens of the town of McCandless, the borough of Franklin Park, the borough of Bradford Woods, Marshall Township, Pine Township, and, and at one point, uh, Richland Township. But just, you know, you get to meet such great people, people that really, um, very caring. I tell my members, if you, if this is getting to your family, this job's not worth having. And if you can't get in the car and drive home, um, I have to travel the whole state in my role as speaker and in my role as majority leader. I have a rule of thumb. I do not spend the night, even if I'm up in Susquehanna County or Wayne County, I get home that night. If it's at two or three in the morning, I'm home. I want to go to these communities and I love them. Seeing all the various communities in Pennsylvania, it's just people are so endearing and they're so warm and they're friendly and, and they, they, like we all have the same goal you know, in our communities and our families. I read this in this little book, uh, a Hallmark book of some type, and it said, don't say you need quality time with your kids. No, you just need time with your kids. Any time with your kids is quality time.
Any time with your wife or husband is quality time. It's, it's making the most of it. Can we all be better? Yeah, I can definitely be better, for sure. I could be better. I look back and I could be better on lots of fronts. But it's putting in the time and it's letting them know that they are first. If they call, you take the call. I tell that to every member. If your wife or husband calls, you take that call. Drop whatever else you're doing and take the call. They gotta know you're first. And if they don't think you're f they're first, then why, should, why would they support you? That's a tough act to follow, but then again, Mike Terzai has always been a tough act to follow, and I can say that. I knew him when he first ran for office back in 1998. He was the Republican nominee against Bill Clink, then the Democratic congressman, and uh, out in western Pennsylvania. And a funny thing happened to him on his way to Congress. He was happy to learn he placed second. But, you know, Ronald Reagan once said there are second acts in life and in politics that is oh so true. The last three presidents before Donald Trump all began their political careers by losing races for Congress. John Kerry, U.S. Senator, presidential nominee, and Secretary of State, also started his career with a race for the House that was unsuccessful. And now, we have somebody here who, of course, did have quite a second act and quite a run in politics. Uh, three years after his race for Congress, a uh, House seat opened up when Joan Ory went on to the state Senate, and sure enough, Mike Terzai was Representative Terzai, albeit State Representative Terzai. He went on to be Majority Leader and Speaker of the House for three terms, and he's here with us today. Welcome, Mr. Speaker. Oh, John, thank you for having me and uh, to the Pennsylvania Leadership uh, Council. What an honor uh, to be here. Well, one of the things that's an obvious question is you served as Speaker for three terms, and what was your biggest accomplishment presiding over a house where you had a majority as high as 122, I believe? Yes. You know, it's interesting. We had a uh, Democratic governor, Tom Wolf, uh, during that entire tenure. But we still um, had significant legislation that uh, we accomplished. And it, and it was in many ways because we backed the governor into a corner between the House and the Senate. Um, one, we did uh, privatization. We originally put full privatization of the wine and spirits. And why? Because it's, it's not solely that you can go and buy something in a grocery store, although the convenience is nice. It's really because if you believe in limited government, what are the areas that, that we should not be in? And that would be, I think, the first one that would come to your mind. He vetoed that. Wolf vetoed our full privatization bill. But we came back within a year, and we put one on his desk that allowed for the sale of wine and additional beer in um, grocery stores and convenience stores. And it was a, really a first step given that Governor Thornburg um, Governor Ridge, Governor Corbett had all talked about it. Um, we got it done. Second, public pension reform. One of the few states that actually moved to a defined contribution type plan for all new employees, um, a 401k type plan, um, and you know, our escalating, uh, really our escalating debt on the public pension uh, table uh, we have two of them, state employees and school employees. We're the, and we're the only one that did it for both pension systems. Uh, we moved into a, a defined contribution type plan moving forward. Um, the other thing that we did is, is we continued to enhance school choice. The governor was always fighting for increased money for public education, which we did. Always invested more each and every year. But one of the trade-offs for that was is there had to be more money for the Educational Improvement Tax Credit scholarships and for the Opportunity uh, Scholarships, um, such that other, I think we are the highest amount of scholarship money other than the state of Florida in the United States of America. And it was just upheld in the Espinoza case. 
all right. It was a Montana, it was a Montana uh, plan, but it was based on Pennsylvania's plan. You certainly were able to put Governor Wolf into a box at different points and come out ahead of the game. Yes. There's no argument on that. But let's go back to his predecessor. When Tom Corbett became governor, people were saying Pennsylvania has the trifecta Republicans salivate over. Republican House, Republican Senate, and a man to sign the bills at the state capitol. Do you think you could have done more with the Republican governor? And let me refer to something specific. Former Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin, faced with a similar situation, moved to end collective bargaining for most public employees in something that riveted the nation and uh, a whole saga I covered in person. Why didn't the Republicans in the legislature pursue a similar course when you had the governor who would have signed it? It's interesting. Um, governor Corbett, as you know, was more middle of the road. Um, he was not a right of center um, from his political perspective. Um, good man, uh, an outstanding attorney general. And um, as, as you know, when he came into office, uh, we had, had taken, we were in the minority in the House. We went back into the majority, and I think our number was 110. Of course, uh, we ended up growing that to 122 ultimately, and now it's, right. now it's back around uh, 110. But the, the key there was is Governor Corbett's um, was really most focused on in increasing the amount of money to go to construction of highways, roads, and bridges. That was really his, his top agenda item. He wanted to increase the gas tax to really to fix infrastructure in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. He was less interested um, in public pension reform and in uh, privatizing the sale of wine and spirits. Now, there was a movement on foot to um, disallow the collection of union dues um, from a government perspective. And, and I was on board with that because that was a, in addition to a, um, a type of uh, check on the public unions, it was also an ethical issue government should not be in the business of, of taking out union dues. People should be able to make that decision on their own. Myself, though, many of my colleagues, and myself included as, as time went on, um, our relationship with the private sector unions, particularly the trades, um, you know, your steam fitters, your uh, operating engineers, uh, electricians, uh, plumbers, iron workers, laborers, um, really, we, we embraced the relationship. M many of our members, particularly in the Southeast, had it, some in the Southwest too. But, but really, we became allies on many fronts. And uh, today, I think it's one of the strongest alliances in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And we were the ones that, that put that into gear. And uh, our focus really became on how do you move forward on school choice, um, aspects of limited government like privatizing uh, wine and spirits. and um, and, and, uh, and public pension reform moving forward. Right. Well, let me take it a step further. Another centrist governor, Rick Snyder of Michigan, in fact, someone who's a Republican for Biden now, nonetheless had his Republican legislature pass right to work and signed it in a major industrial state where this would have been thought of as out of the question. With another, another more conservative governor, would Pennsylvania have right to work today? No, the, the votes would not have been there for right to work. Um, I understand ideologically where people were, but the relationships that had developed with our allies in the trades, uh, I would just say that overall the perspective is, is that issues like prevailing wage should be left alone. These individuals are in the private sector. They don't get paid if they don't work. They don't get paid if they're not collecting health care benefits or they don't get their health care benefits if they're not working because they contribute it, they contribute to their own pensions. And, and uh, if they, they have to pass drug tests, they have to go through significant educational training. We think that the focus should be on career and technical training and on school choice. Yeah. Charter, we're pro-charter school, we're pro-scholarships, and uh, we're, we're pro-career and technical education, all at the same time while investing in public education so that everybody has opportunity. That really was our focus. All right. So you're saying no matter who the governor is, even if Republicans control the legislature, 
ending collective bargaining and right to work are pretty much out of the question. It, would, the it, would, have, it would be very difficult, yes. Okay. Uh, now, on the issue of um, not being able to have the state or local governments uh, collect your union dues, there was a sizable subset of members, myself included, who felt that the government should not be involved with that. We did do a vote when uh, under Governor Wolf, and I think our high water mark was a little over 90. We did not have 102 votes for that. All right. Explain fair share to our uh, viewers. Yes. Uh, you know, it was my first really significant issue that uh, I worked on when I came into the legislature. Legal liability reform or uh, tort reform. I, I, I was high at my list. Now, I'm an attorney, but I had just seen how the legal system had been abused uh, significantly, um, really by the trial lawyers. Hmm. And, um, and then they would go about trying to make sure that our judges are elected in Pennsylvania at all, at all levels, including the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. They wanted to make sure that um, there was going to be uh, trial lawyers in the judge positions. And we felt that there had to be changes in uh, the legal system, uh, caps, on punitive, caps on damages overall, caps on punitive damages. But the Fair Share Act was there's this uh, doctrine, and I was the first person to introduce a bill on this, called joint and several liability. And if you were found even 1% at fault and you had the deep pocket, you would have to pick up the tab for 100% of uh, that's who they'd come after, the deep pocket. And what did that do? That encouraged plaintiff's attorneys to bring in as many defendants as possible and to come up with any tangential relationship. And these judges wouldn't kick those claims out of court as I think they should have. And we got that done. We passed it not once, not twice, three times. We passed it under Schweiker, was overturned by the su state Supreme Court on procedural grounds. We passed it under Rendell, he vetoed it. And finally, that was really our opening bill in the state house when Governor Corbett came in. And it was one of the first bills that got signed into law was that really monumental uh, legal liability reform. You could have been speaker for life if you wanted, or I should say, as long as Republicans held the lower house in Harrisburg. Why did you retire from the position and yield your gavel voluntarily? You know, I'm a citizen legislator, right? That, that's what you are. And uh, moving forward, I just felt like three terms as speaker of the Pennsylvania House was such a great honor. Two terms as majority leader. Yeah. And uh, prior to that, I was uh, the minority whip and, and really helped to lead the charge to take back the majority in 2010. Um, we went out and we recruited uh, like-minded <clears throat> conservatives across the state, raised the money, had an agenda that was focused on private sector job creation, integrity in government, uh, uh, traditional values. You know, many, most of us are, 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 are pro-life in our perspective, right. you know, the dignity of each and every person from the from uh, you know the unborn till your last breath on earth. Womb to tomb. Yeah, yes, oh my goodness, what a great, a, a, an encapsulation of it. Uh, we went out and helped uh, members get elected, and at a certain point, it's time to pass the torch, right? right. And there's a great leadership team, and they needed some runway uh, moving into this election cycle, and uh, it, it, it was opportune. And I believe that the recovery um, from COVID is not going to be led by government. It's going to be led by the private sector. Right. And I had a private sector opportunity. Well, COVID certainly has been a problem for the incumbent governor who has two years left yes. as a lame duck. And assuming Republicans hold the legislature, I can see the words of Alfred Lord Tennyson surrounding Tom Wolf, that power ignores a dying king. Uh, how do you see his final two years if Republicans have the legislature? You know, the, 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 the key uh, for the Republican legislators is, is to continue to focus on the private sector. Um, where's, where's the opportunity for growth? Where's the recovery going to come from? Look, under President Trump, um, on two fronts, his policies with respect to the tax cuts and his mm -hmm. policies with respect to trade, whereby he's focused on manufacturing in the United States and energy independence in the United States, um, and the, the fact that he had a regulatory overhaul, actually three, three fronts, changed the dynamics in this country and improved the opportunities in terms of jobs for everybody, including in an industrial state like Pennsylvania. 
But we, too, had been focused on that as Republican legislators, jobs, jobs, jobs. We held off the severance tax. Uh, why? Because we felt that the opportunities from natural gas, which is the cleanest fossil fuel, um, and where the Shell petrochemical facility employed, what, 7,500 tradespersons in yes. building that facility. And then we had a tax credit um, that the governor vetoed, but then a compromise came subsequent to my leaving uh, up in the Northeast. But it was my idea, and, um, and my good friend Aaron Coffer ran with it, but it was an idea I had for some time to allow for uh, agribusiness using natural gas to uh, really have opportunities to grow in terms of manufacturing in our state, primarily in the northeast region of the state, you know, around Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, and, and Hazleton. Those opportunities is where the, the House and the Senate need to focus. We can, and it's already happening, people are, are doing it themselves. You know, the private sector um, is about bringing jobs back to, the, to Pennsylvania, to the United States, Focus on those private sector opportunities. Uh, diverse ed ener energy, diverse manufacturing have to be a part of the mix in this state. Mm -hmm. Now, did the fracking uh, enterprise, the fracking opportunity, as some say, grow under your speakership? It, it, it did, and, 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 and in large part because um, we focused on using the natural gas that we have in our state to the benefit of our citizens. Right. And um, what we saw from the get-go was is that you could improve the lives of citizens, not just in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, but in counties like Beaver, Washington, Westmoreland, uh, Butler, Indiana, Armstrong, that surround Pittsburgh, that are, are part rural, part small town, and many of those towns all across Pennsylvania had shuttered. You know, go up to, go up to um, Route 6, you know, across the northern tier. You go in, into a towns like, you know, uh, or counties, I should say, like Tioga and, um, and McKean and Susquehanna. Um, the opportunities from natural gas and the growth that has come with it has improved those communities um, in, in ways for their citizens that we hadn't seen for years. And, and without that opportunity to be able to develop the natural gas here and to turn it into a petrochemical facility product, the plastics, and or into the agribusiness products like ammonia, that's, a, that's, that's great for the citizens of Pennsylvania. Right. Two questions to you as citizen Terzai. Number one, now that you're out, do you think there should be, as there is in the Congress, a term limit on the speakership and committee chairman in the House? It has certainly been an idea that has been debated in uh, the State House of Representatives. I'm going to leave that to my uh, successors, um, you know, to, to grapple with that issue. But I will say that there was um, somewhat of a groundswell that, that they felt that that there should be at least some type of a process that allows for other folks to have that opportunity to serve in those roles. And remember, Pennsylvania used to limit their governor to one term. Yes, one yeah, point. for quite some time. I, I think Schaap was the first Schaap one. Schaap was the first in yeah. 1970. Now, final question. You explored and were seriously in the water as a gubernatorial candidate in 2018. You're a private citizen now. You don't have the constraints that a Speaker of the House did with a constituency of over 100. Uh, will you look at the governorship in 2022? Let me tell you right now, I'm so blessed to have this private sector opportunity and to help, help Pennsylvania move forward in terms of energy independence and, uh, and, and providing low cost uh, natural gas through, uh, really, we're a utility. Uh, through utility and making sure that it's safe. That's number one, safe. You have to be safe, cost affordable, take care of its citizens. You get a, a towel out of a dryer or if you um, uh, power up an electric plant or you, 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 know, you wanna have a warm home at an affordable cost and making sure that those opportunities are there for every citizen, no matter what their income, I'm serving the people of Pennsylvania in the private sector, and, uh, and I'm honored to, to do it with a great group of, uh, a great group of individuals. 
And, and I will tell you that I think Pennsylvania is poised for a private sector rebound after this COVID, just like it was uh, pre, and I want to be a part of that endeavor. Spoken like someone who's been in public life enough to be inoculated, but certainly not to be addicted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you so much, John. What an honor. And I have to tell you, I have read your materials uh, going back to human events. I know you're with Newsmax. Um, you are so uh, principled and balanced. Uh, for me to share the stage with you today is quite an honor. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The feeling is mutual. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in.